Hello. Hello. Hi. Paulo, can you mute, please? Because it's windy there. Hello, all. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hi. Okay, I think we should start. Hello all. I would like to thank you for having the time to be here and to discuss this uh, very important topic. Uh, on our last meeting, we concluded that uh, we needed to see the space crease in more detail. Uh, this related to a specific author, author's uh, use case. So today, we'll be learning a little bit more about the space crease and Andrea Bolini will host and lead this session uh, I think until, until the, the discussion. So I will hand over to the, the Zoom platform to Andrea for him to, to, to give us this detailed uh, session about the space crease. Okay, thanks, Paulo, to introduce the meeting. Uh, can you just confirm that you heard me correctly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yes. So I'm going to uh, to share my screen to to present some slide that I have prepared for uh, the meeting. I'm also going to put the link to the slide on Slack. Uh, I see that Tim used the general channel to remember, so maybe I put the slide here. Okay. Okay, so I decided to create a slide uh, to go through all the question that was prepared in the Google Doc. So this could be the, the most effective way to, to, to manage the discussion. I hope to have an interactive discussion more than just present some slide. So the, the first question, a uh, group of questions are related to the data model. And the first question was how the data model work related to, um, to authors. Uh, essentially, we have some documentation available uh, in this regard. We have lost you, Andrea. Hey, can okay. you hear? Or? I'll ping him on Slack to let him know we cannot hear him.
on Slack. He said he was kicked off the Zoom channel and he's reconnecting. Okay, thanks. Okay, I should be here again. Yep, we hear you. Okay. You cut off almost immediately, Andrea, on the first slide there. Okay. So I say that I prepared uh, some slides that uh, go to all the questions that was prepared into Google Doc. Uh, the first question was about the data model and how the space Chris managed the authors. So I have had uh, two links to the existing documentation about that and some summary information. So one thing is the entity is named the research page in this space case. It is abbreviated as RP. And we also name it the research profile over the documentation. So you can find both names. The entity is linked with uh, uh, to the space item using the authority framework. This means that you have a choice authority that implement the variant support interface uh, to link the space item with, uh, uh, with, the authority, uh, with the author, with the researcher. You can, during the submission, you can have a lookup, you can have autocomplete that will query your uh, uh, research directory, and you can pick one or more author. And this information is stored in the item using uh, the, the author name as text value and the, identi the Chris identifier as authority. So it is based on the authority framework, the standard uh, setup of the space. The inverse relationship uh, instead is discovered uh, at runtime. So in the author profile, we don't store the list of all the item, but this is uh, retrieved uh, with a solar query. So we query uh, solar to ask all the item that have uh, an author metadata with the authority uh, key of the, of the author. Uh, the most important thing is uh, then the authority. Oh, sorry. The, the data is is uh, uh, stored uh, in the database, and uh, um, the data model is configured. So this just just, like just one thing, Andrea. We don't see our browser. Uh, I don't know if you want to show anything, but. If you want to do that, you have to share your full screen, not only the PowerPoint application. Oh, okay. We are, we are seeing your PPT slides, not the browser, okay? Okay. Do you want to show the browser? You have to, to share the full screen. I'm not sure to desktop. It's the upper left corner option. Now you see my yes yes yeah browser? okay yeah okay mm. so the, the data structure of this space Chris is uh, flexible is not something that is uh, predefined when you talk about a researcher you uh, out of box you don't know which attribute this researcher will have and you are not limited to uh, name or uh, affiliation or other aspect of the author, but you can decide to store how many attributes and relations are uh, needed for the author. This is the most important fact and feature of the space case. So the data model is completely dynamic. And you can configure the data model um, using the, uh, some administrative user interface or some Excel file to load uh, your configuration, and your configuration is stored into the database. This is quite important because this means that just looking to the database, you can validate your, um, your data. For instance, if you decide to, uh, to have in your data model a new attribute for the researcher, and you want that this attribute is mandatory, 
This information is stored in the configuration of the data model, is stored in, in the database table. And uh, looking to the configuration in the database, you can check if the value in your database are coherent with your current configuration or not. Another important aspect is then any Chris uh, entity have a Chris ID that is independent from the uh, database sequence. So you have something like RP0001, uh, but uh, this uh, uh, entity also have uh, uh, a sequence ID in the database and also have a new ID generated by the database to be used where we want to have generic link without know in, uh, in advance if we are talking about a researcher, an organization, or other entity. Mm. The, the second question was more in depth. So which table are created or uh, modified by the space Chris? The decision is to don't modify any table. The space table are uh, untouched, and all the changes happen in additional tables. So we only have created additional tables in the, uh, in the space schema. These uh, additional tables are prefixed uh, with Chris underscore or JD underscore, mm -hmm. uh, except very few exceptions that are related to functionality that uh, mm, could work uh, in a standard space without major uh, change. So it was uh, in, in some way prepared to be merged with the space also with the name of the table. This was the duplication, a, a different way to, to mine the OI and uh, some table related to uh, import procedure to, to populate the space using the table. Uh, Jedina is uh, uh, an underlying uh, library that we have developed to manage the, uh, the configurable data model. So all the data model is something that is shared between all the entities of the space Chris, and this shared layer uh, comes from the Jedina library. The, um, the table related to the Jedina library, so primary, the, configuration of the data model and where the uh, final value are stored for each attribute or relation stay in, uh, um, in table that are named JDN underscore something. If we open the browser uh, to link to the documentation, here you will found uh, uh, the, the table that are related and uh, this is probably the most uh, important one. That is uh, the, the, um, the diagram that put in relation the table JDNA values with uh, uh, some Chris underscore table. JDNA underscore values is something that is uh, very similar to our uh, metadata value table. So uh, essentially is uh, the, the single table where all the, uh, the value uh, are stored for any attribute uh, of any mm, Chris entities in the system. The major difference between the Jedina values table and the metadata value table is then uh, Jedina value have a, a different column for each type of content that need to be stored. So if you have an attribute in, uh, in the researcher profile that is a string, the column with, uh, uh, with the club will be used, and uh, um, the text column will be used, and uh, um, the value will be managed at the base level as a text. But if one of the attribute of the researcher is uh, a date, for instance, the beer date, uh, it will be stored at the database level uh, as a timestamp. So Jedina used the, the right uh, type, uh, type column for uh, each attribute. This gives you a better guarantee about the integrity of data in your system.
Most importantly, uh, you also maintain uh, in this table the relation. So if one attribute is used to link one entity, one displaced Chris entity with another displaced Chris entity, it would be the case of uh, uh, a relation between uh, a project and a researcher made by the, the principal investigator or the co-investigator. Uh, um, this relation is maintained in a column in the Jedina value tables. It is a foreign key to the Chris Earth page uh, table. So this means that you are sure that uh, the link between the project and, uh, uh, and the researcher is actually a, a researcher profile and cannot be an organization unit or cannot be a broken link. It's not just a string, it's not just the ID of the uh, researcher that could be changed or things like that. So Andrea, could I ask a question there on that real quick? Yes, please. Um, so you said, okay, so different values, the values are stored in different uh, columns. They're based on the type. So you have text value, date value, link value, it looks like. Are those the only three types of data? Am I understanding that correctly? In the JDINA values field, uh, you said that- uh, Right now, yes. Thing. We use string, number, date, uh, and link and also file. Oh, and file, okay. Uh, that is used for the picture of the researcher. And you have the, the link to other entity. So you have link to researcher, link to project, link to organization unit, or link to other entities. We can go back on that later also. So um, I, maybe this is a later question. That link to the other entities, I know that you can create new entities. Does that mean the JDINA values table ends up having to be modified with a new foreign key if you have something beyond a researcher page, project, org, unit, things like that? Or how's that when work? When you create a new entity in this place, Chris, you are using uh, one catch all entity that is named dynamic object that is abbreviated as DO. Oh. So the, the last column is the O value. That, okay. that is a, a foreign key to this single table where you have all the other kind of entities. Okay. And this kind of entity have uh, um, an additional relation with a profile. Let's say uh, this specific dynamic object is a journal and this other dynamic object is an awards or this is a laboratories or something else. Okay. So in, in the case of additional entity, you still have some integrity at the level of the database, but is not so strong as in the, uh, or in the case of a researcher page, project, and the organization unit. Right. Okay, that makes sense. But if you change the data model in this space, Chris, also adding a new entity, you never touch the database, you never touch the, uh, uh, the source code. Yep. Yeah, that makes this sense is, now. Yeah, this is quite important and was one of our requirements at the start. Also to keep the database untouched. So if you have other system connected with the database, uh, that is not uh, the best way, of course, to make integration, what happened. They will be, uh, um, they should be untouched by your extension of the database. Andre, uh, Andre, when you refer to first class uh, um, entities, you are saying the researcher profile, project, uh, organization unit, or uh, yes, which which so, ones? Yeah, the first class citizen for this space Chris are researcher page, project, and organization unit. Okay, At the end, they don't have. Uh, any special behavior, except for some very specific functionality for the researcher page, all the other entity have the same behavior. The difference is then they go on a separate table. So you have a table for researcher page, a table for project, and a table for organization unit, and a table for anything else. 
But if you look to the table definition, it is exactly more or less the same for all two entities. So the reason to do that was to have a, a strong integrity constraint when you create relation among these first level citizens. So we don't want to uh, also at the database level to be able to, to mix uh, organization with project when we deal with affiliation. Of course, the user interface will uh, give guarantee about uh, uh, this kind of link also for dynamic object for other entities, but this is something that is assured by the user interface. You can always go directly onto the database and make change. But when you have a relation between a researcher page and an organization, also, if you go directly with SQL query, you cannot make uh, uh, to data a mess. You still need to link a research page with an organization. You, you will be not able to link with a project. So, so that said then with the uh, dynamic object table, that Chris uh, DO table, um, how are you treating different types of objects in there? Is that the, I see a column at the end there it looks like a type ID. I yes, this type ID is a, a link to uh, another table. That is this one. So in the in this uh, last diagram is uh, um, the class in the uh, right uh, uh, bottom uh, corner is right. Chris Dio underscore TP, and this is the profile, the profile of the Chris Dio. Okay, so that's how you can tell different Chris DOs apart based on their type? Yes, and it is important because this Chris DO is also linked with all the attribute definition. So you know that a journal is characterized by four attributes, the journal name, the international serial number, and the publisher, and the awards is, class is characterized by completely different attribute and relation. Okay. And this information, the profile of the entity is stored into the database. Okay, that makes sense. I don't have any further questions right now. I just want to make sure I understood the, the data model here. Okay. So we still have started to talk about where the data is stored. So the answer is all the data stay in the database. The database is the master of all the information of the space Chris. Uh, the access to the database uh, is uh, mediated by Hibernate. It is from the start of the project. And it works properly with Oracle and Postgres. It is not trivial, also, if you use Hibernate to, to have it uh, uh, running uh, with both um, the BMS engine. But there are running uh, instances of this space case on both, uh, on both the BMS engine. For uh, search and network visualization, we replicate the data in Solar. So similar to what happened with this space, there is an indexing process that uh, moves the information from the database to, uh, to Solar to allow search on this object, to allow uh, to OI, uh, OI uh, server, and also to implement uh, the network visualization uh, functionality of the space case, where you can see uh, which are the cognate researcher uh, by co-authoring or by co-investigation on on same project and things like that. Again, one of the other question was the logical uh, relationship transported to the B table, and this is, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the purpose of the foreign key in our um, uh, 
uh, database. So if you have a relationship between a researcher page and an organization unit, this means that you have an attribute on the researcher page that maintains this relation. And this attribute could be the affiliation. And uh, this affiliation will be uh, configured, will be described to say that it is a, a pointer to an organization. And when you say that this attribute is a pointer to an organization, this means that when you go to store the information, uh, this attribute will be stored in the O uh, value column of the Jelina value. That means a column where you have a foreign key constraint to the organization unit table. And this is uh, about the dynamic object. Uh, in the case you create a link between uh, a field citizen increase object and a dynamic object of between two different dynamic objects. Uh, the value is stored in the DO uh, value column of the Jelina value. That means that you have uh, just a foreign key to the generic table of all dynamic object. And uh, uh, it is a responsibility of the uh, Java PI layer to make sure that if you are using an attribute that is configured to allow you to link with a journal, you will be prevent to, to use this attribute to store a link with an equipment or uh, some other entity. So it is important that it is not only responsibility of the user interface, so it, it's not only something that uh, is assured because when you have to autocomplete, you just search on the subset of the journal or the hours and so on. But also the Java API layer know that when they instance an attribute that is a pointer to a journal, they cannot store uh, in, this, uh, in this attribute a relation with an equipment. So essentially, if I understand this correctly, these things you're calling profiles, the dynamic object profiles are almost like the data types of these objects. And you can kind of dynamically assign different attributes or properties to those data types and look those up. Is that essentially the gist? Uh, a profile, so uh, an a profile of a dynamic object is uh, uh, a collection of uh, um, attribute of property definition. So when you say uh, a profile is a journal, you say the profile contains the journal title, the publisher, and the international serial number. So your profile contains three attribute definition, three property definition. And each property definition is characterized by uh, a widget, that means the type of uh, value that is able to be stored in this attribute. So the journal title is a text, and uh, uh, the publisher is a pointer to an organization unit. So okay. you have three different uh, uh, attributes, and each of these attributes have uh, is uh, configuration. But, but Andrea, sorry to interrupt you. This uh, depends on, on the user interface that, that is used, right? This means if you have this widget link or widget date, widget file, this is specific for uh, GSP UI, right? No, this is the, uh, an abstract concept. Uh, widget text, or, uh, text mean uh, um, it's a Java class that know that uh, the value need to be stored as a text at the database level and uh, allow you to configure other aspects that are relevant for a text, such as uh, uh, regular expression validation, or uh, uh, if you, if it is repeatable or not, if it is uh, mandatory or not, 
how long is your text, this, this kind of information. Can, can we see this uh, like uh, um, an extension to the, the input form or something like that? Or not? Sorry. Mm, not really, because the current input form is just about rendering and uh, widget that need to be presented to the user to input information. But all the information that you input in an item are stored as a string. In this case, the, the information that are stored at, at the widget level are related to the uh, specific nature of uh, the value that you want to collect. So at the level of the Java a API class, uh, the widget is responsible to instantiate the, mm, the class where you store the value. If you, in the configuration, have a text, a widget text, this widget text will instantiate a string, and you cannot store a date inside a string because you will have a class class exception at the Java level. If you use a widget date, you will get a Java date class when you instantiate the value. So this, uh, this configuration, this layer is uh, uh, before the user interface. So also if you create some uh, uh, command line uh, script to work with this space crease, you will have this kind of guarantee that you cannot store uh, uh, a text where a date is expected. The, the Java API uh, will prevent you to do that. You will be not able to say, store in my beer today, uh, hybrid uh, in, in letter R4. So if I could ask a more general question here again, because um, I think I'm starting to get the concepts here. Um, when you're using the words attribute and property, those seem to be the same thing, right? Um, so attributes um, that you're talking about at the Chris level are properties in this JDINA. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I'm um, sorry to, to, to change the name. Uh, that's so that's okay. Times. I just want to make sure I understand what things are equal here. Um, so I'm just noting that, that I, I caught that, that attributes and properties are the same. Um, profiles, when you're using profiles, I was trying to tease out what that means when you talk about a profile. It sounds like a profile is just kind of a group of attributes or properties. So you say something is, you just name it a, a journal and you say a journal uses this set of properties and you kind of link those properties to the profile. Is that correct? It's not really a strong yes. data type, but it's just a grouping of properties. It's, I think it's a business object. Yeah, it's a grouping of, uh, of property definition, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the concepts and the terminology used here as we're talking through this. So I'm, I'm good now. And you need uh, the profile when you have uh, many, many property defined and you don't want to allow any instance to use all this property definition. That is the case of dynamic object. Right. When you have the researcher page, you don't have profile because all the property that are defined for a researcher page belong to a researcher profile. So in some way is uh, uh, Chris RP, Chris or, or unit and Chris project are uh, elected profile to, to be more evident. Right, they're a little bit more strongly typed prof profiles, whereas the dynamic object one is not really a strongly typed profile, but you can create the same sort of groupings of attributes and properties. Something yes. along those lines, okay. And this also is related to the uh, different definition that you have in this diagram. So where you say property or property definition, this could be Chris, uh, could be RP property or RP property definition, if it is something that belongs to a researcher, 
and here we uh, will come to org unit property definition and org unit property in the case of organization unit. So uh, it is exactly the same Java classes, but different table uh, onto database because our uh, is a Java class that extend the, the abstract concept of property definition. Okay, that, that makes enough sense to me. Go ahead and continue. I just want to make sure I got the concepts here. Okay, but we can go back on that uh, because it's the most important part. So, uh, another question was about the permission. Uh, we don't use the same, uh, um, the same layer than the space, so we don't have an ACL on, uh, um, on this space Chris object. And uh, we can see uh, to, to slide on uh, this link, maybe later. Uh, every Chris object have a status flag that could be active or inactive. Only uh, objects that are active have a public page that can be accessed by non-administrator or owner of this object. So this means that if you, uh, you flag your Chris object as inactive on the public page of this space, uh, this space of this space Chris, this, uh, this object uh, does not exist. You will not find it uh, uh, in the search, in the browse. You cannot access directly to uh, the object page. But inactive objects are always usable as authority. So you can decide to make your all your research page uh, inactive, but you will be still able to use uh, the list of your researcher page to suggest author name in the submission. And the authority uh, key will be uh, still stored with the uh, uh, Chris ID of the researcher page. So in this way, you are able to use the space Chris entity as a, a controlled list for your metadata. And you have administrative user interface to maintain your controlled list. And you are also uh, able to, um, to manage validation on your Chris entities because you can allow a, a researcher to describe an item and link this item to a Chris object but maybe this Chris object is directly described by the researcher during the submission, and you want to have your administrator to take a look to the, this Chris object before to approve and make this Chris object description public available. This is the, the, the purpose of the active inactive uh, flag. Once a uh, um, Chris entity is active and have a public page, you configure the public page. So um, in the data model configuration, you decide uh, you need to split all the, uh, the property that you have defined, all the attributes that you have defined in, uh, in different sections. So you say that uh, the researcher profile have uh, a part related to personal information, a part related to research interest, and uh, a part related to the career. And this could be uh, different uh, tabs or uh, subsections, so boxes. Once you have created this concept of the, 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 pay, the, the section and subsection, you can decide to limit uh, a specific uh, section or subsection to only administrator, only to owner of the resources, or also limited group of a person and group. So uh, for instance, you can decide that uh, some data of the project are very sensible and you want to expose these uh, data only to the investigator of the project. So you configure the, uh, the project to have a section of uh, uh, sensible data 
and this section sensible data is configured to be vis visible only to uh, the, the person or the group that are specified in a specific attribute of, uh, of the project itself. This also means that the project A can, be, uh, can have sensible information visible by me, and the project B could, be, could have the same uh, sensible uh, property visible by team, but not for, uh, by me. So this is so, much more detailed and fine-grained than the current uh, security of, uh, of the space because go to the single uh, metadata uh, information. Yeah, so one quick question on how you manage the permissions. Are those done via the normal resource policies in DSpace, or is this a different sort of permission thing when you're talking about managing permissions of sections? No, it's not done in... Uh, um, in the resource policy, because it's not a CL, so it's not a resource policy. Okay. It is maintained uh, using the attribute. I want to open this link. You have to, to play the PowerPoint. Yeah, or. yeah, I don't want to take up too much time. I know we have limited time here, Andrea, but that, that was a good enough okay. explanation, um, just that it's not in resource policy, it's in the attribute level, you said. You can basically limit yes yeah, so when you configure the data model you can say this group of uh, property that is sensible uh, should be visible only uh, to the person or the group that are specified in this other uh, property of the entity but but who who does that the 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 author the owner of the property or who you configure that. So you have an attribute that is uh, authorized the user. So in the, in the project entity definition, you create a property that is named authorized user. This property is defined as a, a pointer to a group, a space group. And when you populate uh, the project, uh, you have this. Uh, this metadata to, uh, to input, and in this metadata you say, okay, the, the group are uh, director of the department. So, so it's in, the, in the attribute of the, of the entity, you store the link with the uh, e-person group. Right, so it's a part of the entity definition, basically. Well, the property or, yes. or attribute and definition of the entity can say, uh, when you have this entity, this property is access restricted in some way. So an administrator would control this essentially as you're setting up your entities, correct? Yeah, uh, anyone that is able to edit the entity. Okay, yes. To, to, to edit this field, that okay. is not the same thing. So you can also decide, well, very, at very granular level, who will be able to, man, to manage the security of the, uh, of the entity. That makes because sense. Because if you make the, the, the field, the property that maintain the information about who is authorized to see this property, editable to someone, this will be able to, to manage the security. And the uh, other important information about visibility and security in this space, Chris, is also that every um, information in the space crease have a flag that mean uh, um, where you can say if this uh, uh, information is visible or not. So assuming that you have a, a property in the researcher profile to, to store the email address and this property is repeatable, you have uh, uh, three email addresses associated with me, my profile, and I can decide that uh, the first two are not public visible, the first two value of my email. And only the last one that is my professional email is public exposed.
makes sense. Okay, so uh, yes, all to that to the space crisis entity are exactly the same, uh, unless at the level of the database and the main um, behavior. Uh, what is different is just the researcher page, actually, that have some uh, additional feature. One is related to the ORCID integration, and the other is related to the uh, fact that you can decide to, uh, to give a, a special role to a person related to a specific uh, researcher profile. So you can associate a, a user account on a person with the researcher profile and it becomes the owner of the researcher profile. When any person is the owner of a, a risk entity of, the, of a researcher profile, it is allowed to edit the information in this profile. And you can decide which information are editable by the owner and which one are limited to the system administrator. By default, uh, uh, the space Chris user interface allow edit of Chris entity only to system administrator. So if you need to edit a project, the only one that is able to edit a project is an administrator. If you want to allow other to create new project or edit project, you need to go with a um, more sophisticated uh, um, way that is essentially to use an item submission to create this related entity. This is quite usual when you deal with uh, author project and so on, because for instance, you are going to submit a, a publication and you want to say that this publication was funded by a project uh, age 2020 in Europe or uh, some other project. What happened is that you have uh, um, an item metadata that use the project, the Chris project as authority. You can look up in the existing project list and maybe you don't find uh, the project that you need. So uh, you will input the project title directly into uh, item submission and uh, you go ahead and complete your submission. What happened is depending on the configuration, Chris is able to use the title that you provided in the, uh, in the item submission to create a new Chris project entity and uh, fill the Chris project entity metadata with information that you have provided in the item. So at the end, you will automatically create a project during the submission of the publication. And of course, you can do that in a very sophisticated way. So during the, pro the um, cataloging of the publication, you can ask several information about the project. And uh, if the project is created, you move this information that was asked during the item submission into, pro into project entity. So if you ask for the grant number, the funder, the project uh, date, all this information will be moved from the item to the project when the project entity is created. The other set of question was about uh, uh, that API. And uh, I think that this is mostly a question related to future plan. Because of course, uh, Currently, you can uh, access this data on the user interface, and this will be changed with the space seven, because we want to switch to Angular also with uh, with the space Chris. Uh, but the other strategy is you can uh, retrieve your data uh, in an Excel file, so you can uh, export and import uh, Chris entity using the Excel file. You can do that also uh, using XML file, but it was not really efficient and uh, we was not aware of uh, anyone that still use it. It is in the source code, but uh, we don't use it essentially. 
Uh, it is only used by the um, SOAP web services. So since a long time, the space crews have uh, uh, web services to access uh, uh, the information about uh, the first uh, level citizen, so the research profile, organization unit, and project using SOAP. And uh, XML that is uh, uh, encapsulated in the SOAP uh, response is dynamically generated from your configuration. So if you create new property, new attribute, this information is uh, returned into XML file. And the uh, XML file is linked to a mix and XSD definition that is generated at the runtime using your configuration. Because of course you will, uh, if you have a, an attribute to store a TML address, this, uh, this uh, attribute will be a node in uh, uh, in XML that is returned by the platform. Uh, the data from the space crease can be also exposed over OIPMH. This is not something that you find out of box in the official release of the space crease, but it is uh, something that we are working in a side branch and will be really merged in the next weeks. Because right now it's just a customization of a single project. The plan for uh, the space Chris 7 is to go exactly in the same way than uh, the space. So we want to have a uh, REST API on the backend to allow crude operation over all the entities. So you will be able to create, edit, delete, list all the, uh, the space Chris entity. And we want to also implement endpoint that allow the Angular user interface to implement all the functionality that are currently uh, offered by the JSPU uh, UI interface of the space case. So we are going to expose endpoint to um, with the network information for the collaboration between a researcher, between organization. We will expose uh, information about uh, uh, inverse relations so that you can ask which publication belongs to a specific author, which project belongs to a specific uh, researcher, and so on. All the, uh, the improved notifications, statistics, metrics, all of that will be also exposed as a REST endpoint. Yeah, and just to add to that, just for folks who are not as plugged into the DSpace 7 work, um, when Andrea is talking about the HAL REST API, that is the DSpace 7 REST API. So this would be an extension of the DSpace 7 REST API to add new endpoints so that DSpace Chris could use the same sort of Angular interface and extend that DSpace 7 Angular interface. Correct, Andrea? Yes, absolutely. Uh, another question was about uh, the logs. Uh, out of box, DSpace Chris don't log much. Uh, but what happened is then DSpace Chris used the application service design pattern. Essentially, it means that there is a single point of uh, access for all the persistent operation. There is a single class that is very lightweight because it's based on Spring and on uh, AOP. It performs all the save, delete, retrieve operation uh, from the data store to uh, integer API layer. And uh, uh, you can uh, plug in uh, generic behavior in this layer using uh, Spring AOP. This is exactly how the transaction management is implemented in the space Chris. So in the space Chris, you will not find any explicit uh, management of the database transaction. We don't open a new transaction. We don't commit a transaction programmatically, but we only use transaction management by AOP and Spring. That is the modern way to, to manage transaction. And this means that you can just put in a spring configuration, in a, in a spring bin definition, you can say that you want to log all uh, the save operation, all the delayed operation with a lot of detail in a specific login file. And you don't need to hack an existing code, you just need to plug in your additional behavior. 
the usage statistics of the usage event when you access on the public face uh, an entity, uh, the event is logged in, uh, in the solar statistics score in uh, exactly the same way than uh, the space due for item view and uh, this stream download. We have only added uh, a field in the solar uh, statistics docs that uh, allow us to make, to cross join the search and statistics score to allow aggregation. Essentially, this means that we are able to say which is the most downloaded publication of a specific researcher or of a specific department. And uh, uh, we can do that without uh, adding on each view uh, detailed information about uh, the metadata of the item. Because this was uh, uh, one of the strategy of the, the basic space to have metadata or synthesis statistics, but it was uh, it, it failed because essentially if you update an item and you change the metadata, you will be required to update a lot of statistics uh, record, and this will be uh, will have several performance issue and is not feasible. So another question was about the REST API endpoint. Uh, right now, we don't have the REST API endpoint for this space, Chris. We have some SOC web services that we want to dismiss uh, in this space, Chris 7, in favor of the REST API. So in this space 7, we will have REST API endpoint for everything, not only crude operation. But if you need to use it immediately, you have the SOC web services. Uh, by default, uh, if you are allowed to access uh, an entity, uh, all the metadata are returned. You can only decide if uh, the client is uh, um, allowed to view hidden value or, or not. Hidden value was the example that I do when I talk about three email addresses associated with my profile. And personally, I want to hide my personal email address and all exposed the professional one. So the, about the, um, the user interface, again, uh, we are talking about the current user interface, but we should look forward to the space Chris 7 that the plan is to go with Angular. Uh, what is important for us in the space Chris 7 is to maintain uh, the current functionality, the feature of this space case. Uh, I think that most importantly is this space case is optimized for search engine and crawler friendly. We implement some micro format to improve the, uh, the indexing of the researcher profile. We implement same posting. And uh, uh, we want to be able to uh, design the uh, the detail page of any entity so that you don't need to, uh, to write code if you configure a new entity, if you change some attribute of an entity at the additional attribute. The default visualization should be uh, organized in section and subsection, uh, like the, the current display screen. But it's most important that also the current display screen uh, version have the ability to provide to provide override to the default layout. So if you need to make something very special, instead to try to fight with complex configuration where you need to decide uh, at the pixel level where you want to put a, a specific uh, attribute, what you can do is to provide your custom implementation for a specific section or subsection that will completely Overwrite uh, uh, what is generated by this space case. So, in the current version, this means that you can provide a JSP file to replace a tabs in a, a entity uh, detail page of this space case, or you can provide a JSP file to replace just a single box or also a single uh, a single field. Another important aspect is then uh, other than show property that are stored, attribute uh, information that are stored in the, uh, in the entity, when you visualize uh, an entity, you want to be able to show dynamic component. 
such as the list of publication uh, that belong to a researcher, the list of publication that belong to an organization, uh, the list of projects, and, and things like that. And also you want to, uh, to be able to do that, to use that as an extension point so that you uh, can use this, this infrastructure to build a, a box or tabs where you expose metrics, bibliometrics information, or you expose information like more like these, contextual news, a Twitter stream about uh, an organization, a project, or something like that. Uh, and the, this space Chris allows search with uh, um, a global search that uh, uh, where you can search across all the entities defined in the system, both the space site and then uh, the space Chris entities. It allow uh, to create specific section where you search just in the researcher profile, just in the organization unit. So is uh, uh, you can create a section of your repository. It also support uh, the same browsing capability that the space have for the item, also for the, uh, all the other entities. So that you can have the list of researchers by department, uh, by uh, research interest, uh, similar to how you get the list of publication by keywords or by author. And uh, um, this space space is very friendly with the other uh, external identifier. And one important feature is then if you have any external identifier such as the ORCID ID, you can use the ORCID ID to directly address uh, a researcher profile uh, page in this space space without knowing the internal ID of, of the researcher page. This is quite convenient when you need to link other system with this space Chris. This was last question. I think that we are short on time. But one of the questions was, when we migrate to the space seven, we still think that uh, it is convenient to maintain some uh, uh, information uh, onto the database level related to how to uh, organize the information. This is because the logical grouping of fields is uh, useful also in, in, in other parts of the application for other interface other than the, the web interface. So if you create a, a section with uh, um, profile information and career and another section with the career of the researcher. Essentially, this, this way to, uh, to organize the, the CV will be used also in the report or on the rest and point because you can use this different section as projection value for the rest and point so that you can ask just for the minimal information about the profile, the, the contact information, or you can ask about the career of the researcher and so on. More detailed information like the label, the pixel positioning of uh, each attribute can be maintained everywhere in, in any place that is convenient for the new user interface. So I think that we will discover that when to implement a new Angular user interface. That's all. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Honestly, I, that was very helpful for me, I know. Yeah, I, I think it was uh, super useful. It is uh, really very tough to show eight years of work in, uh, in 50 minutes. Um, so uh, I don't know, Paul, if you want to, to, to say anything, but I, I have uh one question and uh, two, actually two questions and uh, one suggestion the the first one is uh is this that you wanted to see because uh me and the cap team uh, we we were discussing what uh, to ask to andrea and so uh, we need to know if this was the expected result or you need additional information and the second question is what to do next and um i have a, i have a suggestion but uh, i want to to hear more from you 
May. Um, for me, I'll say that it was useful just to understand how this data is stored. So it was kind of along the lines of what I was hoping to get out of this, like what the data model looks like underneath. Um, but that said, I've, I've kind of seen some of these DSpace Chris uh, presentations before elsewhere. So I understand the upper level of stuff and I'm constantly talking to Andrea <laughs> on the DSpace 7 project. So I know some of the other stuff already, um, but it was useful for me. I found it quite useful and I, I like the flexibility that I see in this design. Okay, others, Levan, you want to make any comments? Uh, yeah, but I didn't want to use up too much time. Um, yeah, I think the main question without going into any details that I'm having is that I see that several things are approached differently um, than in D space, I'm not giving any judgment whether or not it's better or not. Um, but for example, the way that logging is handled. And so if we were to discuss how to merge this code into the standard D space core, it does seem like we also need to decide whether or not um, we want to rework some existing um, functionality in D space. Um, because it, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have two separate ways of dealing with things. Um, so I, I, you know, it's, it's more of a, an observation that this is going to be a lot of work if you want to merge DSpace Chris with DSpace and maintain some kind of consistency throughout the code. But I, I'm sure that that's a discussion for later on in uh, other meetings. But uh, thank you, Andrea, it's very uh, clarifying. Okay. Any other comments on, on the presentation itself? Um, because uh, I was thinking on what to do next and uh, my suggestion, uh, I don't know if you agree, I really don't know, but I think this is uh, short, of course, this is only one hour presentation. And I don't know if we could uh, uh, produce an exercise uh, that uh, uh, some groups could uh, do in order to better understand uh, how this space crease works. For instance, to build a simple profile. Andrea can give us an exercise with the steps and uh, we can divide in two or three groups and devote some hours to do it. And, uh, to better understand. Uh, I don't know if this uh, this is a good idea or it will take too much time, but uh, it's difficult to, to get the sense of the application without, uh, without playing with it. So I don't know, really. Yeah, I, I agree that hands-on experience or it's just short hands-on experience would definitely be good to further deepen the understanding. Yeah, about, we have two order of problem here. One is the, the the most easy thing that you can check is the user experience and how the feature are, which feature are provided to the end user. But here, um, essentially, you are testing something that will be will never be this space Chris seven, or cannot be this space with this space Chris merged inside because we need to change. So the current user experience that you see on, uh, on the GSPI, you can like or you can not like, but it does not matter because it will be not what we can achieve merging this space Chris in this space. So from one side, I say that from the other, it could be useful to, uh, to better understand what I try to explain today make some experiments with the current uh, demo. We have a public uh, test drive installation. So the, you can log in and you can play with, uh, with it to just try to better understand the concept, how a proper definition is configured. You can try to add a new attribute, see how it works, how it appears in the different uh, part. But the configuration of the data model is a very complex task. And is the most uh, important part of uh, any project. So if you go with the uh, default uh, data model that we, that we propose out of box, 
you get some functionality. But if this out-of-box uh, data model don't fit exactly your use case, it is not trivial to, to know how to modify the data model in the best way to accomplish your use case. Because you will be able to do the same thing in different way. And once any option has different benefits or contributions. Uh, Andrea, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, the, the point here is not to make uh, all of us uh, go crazy. Uh, I, the point would be even to have an assisted exercise. I mean, assisted, I mean, I mean you could, uh, for instance, provide us the Excel that has the, the configuration for the author profile, but you could see how we load, you could see what the changes are on the tables. It's, 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 it's different from losing a lot of time to see and to understand everything. But it will give you, in a fast way, a good perception of uh, how the system works. I, I, I don't know. I'm just uh, trying to, to see what's the best way to move forward. Because do you feel comfortable taking a decision today? I think it's, it's, we have no enough information. So. Joe, I think um, when, when I heard Andrea speak about how to adapt the configuration in the best possible way, I think that is mostly where it would be useful to have like an exercise where, for example, Andrea can start with, okay, this is the default data model. Um, let's assume you want to add, I'm just going to say something, an ORCID identifier to the profile um, and want to link that to projects. I'm just saying something off the top of my head here. but. Um, that kind of simple exercise to change the configuration and see what you know how how it's done in the in the database etc cetera, etc cetera. and if we split up in two or three groups most likely at least one group will not do it in the optimal way and then we can discuss that and see you know and better understand how to work with the configuration and, and, and the data model because the, the I think the end user perspective that's not so much of our concern and as Andrea said it will change in DSpace 7 anyway it's more about how to manage all of the um, the objects the entities the properties the, the the profile for all the attributes and things like that does that make sense Andrea yes for, for sure we can uh, provide uh, the full configuration of the system that is uh, on GitHub, so we can provide you to, to link to the documentation, how to manage it and uh, where the file is. And we can uh, create a Google Doc, like the one that was prepared for this meeting, uh, trying to, to write down some exercise. Mm -hmm. And after that we have the exercise, we can go together to, to execute the exercise. So what is difficult for me now is to create exercise. So I have a default data model and I don't have something that we want to strongly recommend to change into the default data model. Because for instance, the, the example that Levan has done has managed into the default data model of the space quiz. Yeah, it, yeah, it is difficult to create example that uh, makes sense. I don't want to create example that... Uh, don't you have an example from, from a recent project or something where, where somebody changed the... the the profiles or things like that not anything that is very simple or so so common to want to show because if we found something that they say okay this is a useful needs and so common typically we got to improve the default data model uh, andrea i i think i think the important uh thing here is that we agree that we should do a, a hands-on and that the end done should be assisted because otherwise uh, you lose your temper and it's complex and that's not the point. You just want to get the perception. So I think we can work both the, the exercise and also the environment. I think, I don't know if we need more than one machine because if we have three teams, for instance, uh, it, you will need a different machine for each team. Uh, and and uh, I think we can work later on what the exercise uh, would be. Uh, yeah, because the most important is to decide if this is the right path. 
I, I think sure. to, to add to this real quick, if we're talking about an assisted exercise, I'm worried that we're going to be using up a lot of Andrea's time. And to be clear, Andrea is very highly active in DSpace 7, so we're essentially slowing down DSpace 7 development by yanking a ton of his time away. Um, I, 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 I agree with this approach that it would be good to have hands-on, but I'm actually wondering in my mind if we should just do this as a next meeting um, where we can be hands-on together, do more of a live demo of the demo site, walk through, make a suggestion as Andrea is demoing it, and we can see how things interact together. Um, and maybe it's more of an hour and a half meeting or a two hour meeting, um, but I worry about trying to do this separately and use up Andrea's time separately and ask a lot of questions separately. Uh, I understand your concerns. concerns. I just wanted to, to make a clarification. When I uh, said assisted, I mean assisted by the Google Doc itself. The Google Doc would say how to do it and it could have an example. This doesn't mean that Andrea wouldn't take time to prepare that. Of course it would, but it would scale because he wouldn't have to explain to each of the three groups. But it's a different approach. I don't know if uh, there's enough time in two hours to, to do this exercise, but I think it's a good uh, way to move forward as well. I yeah, I think I, I worry about trying to even split in three groups. I, I'm looking at my next two weeks. My next two weeks are packed. <laughs> um, scheduling out time may be difficult unless we can find groups that can work well together. And I don't know how we're going to achieve that easily uh, in this meeting, con considering we're 20 minutes over. That's why I was trying to push it to another meeting. Um, but I mean, I'm willing to go either way. I'm just noting that my own okay. schedule is very tight the next few weeks. So if we're gonna try and do this as a separate meeting, that may be difficult to do. I just want, yeah, I just want to, the, the thing is we are collecting enough information to make an informed proposal to the steering committee. Yep. I, I would answer, uh, I, uh, my, I, my question would be, would you be enough comfortable to have a two hour session and on in order to do that uh, recommendation? Or what, uh, what's, what's, I don't what's, know for sure. Uh, I think I'd, it would require going through the hands-on to see um, whether or not that answers all of our questions. I, I think it's hard for me to respond to that will definitely make, my, make up my mind. I think it will be a good next step, yes. Okay, step by step then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, do you agree then to to in a cup in the in the in two weeks time to have a hands on and we can work the exercise uh, with Andrea probably and and share a Google Doc with you in order to see if uh, all the items are addressed. Uh, you think this is a good way? I, I have some some issue as well. So okay, partially is what the team say. So uh, I'm overbooked, and uh, uh, the effort that was required to also to prepare this meeting um, was too much uh, compared to the many activities that we have uh, involved in the community. So right. uh, yes, probably this morning I spent time to retrieve all the information to try to, to create the presentation, and otherwise I will spend more time on reviewing uh, REST API stuff. Okay, so what do you suggest then? Uh, I need to, to go more slow than, than in this way. So, for instance, in two weeks, I cannot have another meeting. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could be able, but most probably I, I will come back from a travel on Friday, so I, on the 10th, so it could be not possible. I like the idea to, to start to talk about the data model and create some concrete exercise. So I think that this is not the next step, of, uh, the necessary next step. I will share with you to the, the current default data model and the existing documentation about how the data model can be modified on the Excel file. And I will appreciate if we can collect some uh, example of a request, how I can do that because I want to have a better working integration. I want to link project with, uh, uh, with the researcher. The, the example that Levin has done. 
maybe or as additional example because this is already managed into current data model or could become a question like okay this is the current data model but i don't see how this data model address my uh, my use case also if you say that project and the, and the researcher are already related so i don't know what happened as a question what will happen when i i will give you this other pointer to documentation and uh, the data model we should open the, the google doc if we can give more as more time to discuss on that maybe in one month we can collect this question and decide the next step that, that could be a two-hour meeting where we do some exercise together or could be something else we need to see what happened i don't have an answer now mm -hmm. And so, Andrea, just to clarify on, on your point of get, starting up the Google Doc, you're basically wanting to have us install DSpace Chris ourselves locally and try and change the data model, or are we going to be looking at a demo site somewhere that's that we can work on together? Does such a thing exist, I guess? This depends on how many time I have also to... Right. Yeah, I totally understand. Though. So I, if you have time to install locally, it will be very, very nice. Now also we have a, a Docker uh, set up from the University of Bamberg. So they provide a Docker for this space Chris. It, it should be easy to start a new Docker with uh, this space Chris uh, 5.8. It was, I think also for six, sorry, recently. So you can play with a local instance. You can use the public installation of the space Chris. It is periodically uh, clean up. So maybe we can just clean up uh, now at the start of November so that you start with uh, a clean situation and you make some experiment. Or you can just try to, to look to the Excel file and figure out what you want to change. And we can check together. Yeah, essentially we're trying to take as much of it off of your plate and put it on our plates essentially is the goal, right? Because you can't really manage the whole process. Yes, I think this is necessary and also we need to delay a bit the, the meeting in frequency. Right. Otherwise, two, two we, every two weeks is too much to me. Okay. So one week in f uh, one meeting in four weeks time, two hours, and uh, let's try to think on the what to do. And uh, the the installation we 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 must think if it is a uh, uh, for science one or we install one and and uh, yeah and, and I'm and gonna. Note in four weeks' time is the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday break. Okay. We're, we're running up against holidays. So, um, oh, uh, what's the, the date? Uh, it's tw 24th? 24th, yeah. 23rd and 24th is uh, 23rd Thanksgiving Day, but often most universities are closed on the 24th. So, we have the 17th of November or... Uh, then we have a uh, holiday as well in uh, Portugal on the, f on the and I'm I'm out on the 17th traveling so you're welcome to meet without me but we're, we're in a time of year which is hard <laughs> my schedule becomes extremely hard with holidays and travel okay let's try for instance uh, the 22 22nd of uh, November uh, possibly it will yeah for me. yeah so 17th from uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, it, it is better to, to send an UTC calendar because we are all changing days. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. No, it's the same hour as we started today, but on uh, Wednesday the 22nd. It's the same, I, whatever hour is, uh, we started the meeting, it will be the same, but on the 22nd of November. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> okay, sorry, you're right, Sandra, I'm sorry for that, yeah. Okay, I think we are good.
Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any suggestion or question. Doesn't look like the case. So I shall want to just say ah. to mm, some newcomers because I see also some name that maybe don't have seen uh, this space Chris presentation. It is very important that they take a look to the recorded webinar from DuraSpace or from Core that are very recently and show mm -hmm. the end user functionality of this space Chris. Because the today presentation was really under the cover of the space Chris. So okay. Those, um, okay, that uh, also uh, addresses one of the questions. We were supposed to present something on the next steering committee group. I think that it would be better probably to send the link for the video records and then you could jump jump in in the 10 first minutes and uh, have some questions. I don't know what you think, Tim, because 10 minutes is not enough to, it's, you can only do questions and answers and yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that sounds fine, assuming the steering group is going to have time to watch that video between now and next Wednesday, which is the next meeting. They only have a couple days, work days. How long is the, the presentation, Andrea? Uh, the one for Coar was uh, 30 or 40 minutes. I don't remember exactly. Can you send us the link or, or write on the... Yes, and and the, the, other, the other is shorter or do you have any... any... No, this is the, the shorter <laughs> one, the most okay. recent are shorter. Okay. So I think we can talk with uh, with uh, the Salva uh, and ask her, but I see no other way because it's very difficult to do it in. in okay, I post the link on uh, on Slack on the general okay. chat. Okay. Okay. That's all for today, or? Yeah, I think so. I don't have anything else to mention. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Okay. We have our next scheduled meeting, so see you then. And thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.